we're going to begin our time of worship with some verses from Psalm 8. Psalm 8. So if you'd like to stand. The word consider, consider, consider has been running through my mind a lot lately. And so as I'm walking through the Psalms uh, again, just recently finished them, walking through them again, uh, I see David encouraging or, or just being mindful of this matter of, of considering. Psalm 8, a few verses. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies, that you have may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of? You see just the vastness of God and yet just the intimate personal knowledge of him. And in fact, in another psalm it says his thoughts towards us are more than the sands, are more than could be recounted back. What is man that you are mindful of and the son of man that you visit him for you made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor, and then the closing verse, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Father, we are grateful to know you. Uh, grateful that you have created us in your image after your likeness. You have created us to commune with you. And Father, it is very humbling, and it's very hard for our finite minds to comprehend that you uh, who are immeasurable, you who are infinite, you who have created and sustains, sustain all things are also very mindful and very caring and loving and gracious to us. And we agree with David. Uh, who are we that you're even mindful of us? But we thank you that you are. We thank you for this Sunday that we have uh, come together to worship you in spirit and truth. We pray that our worship is found pleasing to you today that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, worship team, all two of you today. We are thankful that you uh, have led us in a time of praises to our Lord. Uh, just the, the beauty of the words there that we sang in the first song, many of them found in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, and then singing about Jesus being our rescuer, the one who rescues, the one who delivers. That's what salvation means, to be rescued, to be delivered. To be rescued and delivered from sin, from death, the eternal punishment of that. And then to sing about Him ransoming, ransoming, yeah, this is going to be a good morning, ransoming us, to be ransomed, purchased back. Through the very person, the very life of Jesus. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And though we will read these verses to start it, it'll, it will be a little while to actually getting back to them. Titled today is Considering Jesus' Words, Do This. Do This. And of course, do this in remembrance of me when we consider the Lord's table. But I also want us to consider just what Jesus has called us to do, commanded us to do, directed us to do. Uh, Luke chapter 22, we'll start with verse 14 and read down to uh, 20. When the hour had come, he sat down in the, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, "This, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, Father, we thank you that we have the account given to us in Scripture here and also in 1 Corinthians 11 as well as Matthew's Gospel, John in a, in a different setting. But we thank you, Father, for, the, for Christ and for His sacrifice and how He took this Passover and, and used it as a means, the closing of that and ushering in the new and living way and how His body uh, and His very lifeblood was given and given that we may be forgiven, may be cleansed, may brought, be brought into your family. Fathers, help us to consider his words, not only here in this setting of the Passover and, and the ushering in of the new covenant, the new and living way sealed by his blood, but help, help us as we go forward into this new year that we would consider all of your word, all of Jesus' teaching, his commands. Uh, Father, we'd not only consider them, but that we would live by them. Be glorified, Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts, to our minds, to our will. For your glory, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Considering, considering. You know, I wonder, we're nine days into this new year. We just started the ninth day into this new year. And I wonder how much consideration in 2021 did we give of God and give of His Word? How much consideration, how much considering of God, of His kingdom, of His Word was part of our everyday lives? How much? Last Sunday, you viewed a recorded message, which I gave myself a D for delivery because I fumbled and stumbled more than the Steelers have all season. It was, it was just bad. Uh, 
but the content was good. It was good because it was God's word. And I thought I really want to just hit that real quick again, uh, so that you would, so that you will, you will consider God's word. And so I gave you that acronym of, of of course, real. Hey, somebody got it. Uh, real, uh, to remember, to examine, to ask, and then to live. Uh, the psalmist says, in Psalm 105, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face evermore, remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders in the judgment of his mouth. And we could turn to a lot of places where we see in God's word that we are called to remember. Remember what? Remember him. Remember his goodness. Remember his mercy Remember what his word says. And so I just want to add, remember who you are in Christ. Remember who you are in Christ. A lot of things in life can get us down, and we can start focusing on those, but we need to stop doing that and remember who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. We're a new creation. We're a child of God. We're forgiven. We have been cleansed. We have been indwelt. We have his abiding presence. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We have the promise of heaven. Uh, so in remembering, remembering who we are in Christ, remembering God's goodness, it should motivate us to be more thankful, to be, to be more grateful. Grateful for his goodness, his mercy, his grace. To remember. Remember who we are as a child of God. And then to examine. And again in the Psalms, Psalm 26, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. It means to test, to prove. And so, of course, we see in another psalm where God's word tells us to, in Psalm 139, that we are to ask the Lord to, where David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ang anxious thoughts, my anxieties. See if there's any wicked or any grievous way in me. So we see David asking God to basically examine him. We see that in Psalm 26. We see that in Psalm uh, uh, 139. And I challenge you with this. As, and of course, anything I give to you, it's already been run through my heart and mind. And I'm musing over it and I'm truly considering it. But I challenge you with this matter of examining our attitude, our mindset for 2021. And so again, here we are, nine days into this new year. What does my mindset, what has it looked like in these last eight days and now into the ninth day? Where is my thinking? Where are my pursuits? So what dominated our thinking? Was it God's glory, his kingdom, his will? Or was it more of a pursuit of self-fulfillment, gratification, living for the here and now? Remember, I shared that with you. And so examining, asking God to examine our hearts. And then to ask. And I think every time, not every time, but probably most of the time when I hear the word ask in, in, in consideration of God's word, considering God's word, I think of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where he says what? Yeah, of course. Ask. Seek. Knock. Right? And that word ask, it means to beg, it means to crave, it means to desire. Ask it will be open, or ask it will be given to you, seek you will find, knock it will be open. And so I challenge us with the th thought of asking the Holy Spirit to, again, to search out our hearts. And ask the Holy Spirit of God to lead us to repentance, to turn from our sin, from selfishness, and to rekindle and to renew a desire within, within our inner being. A desire for Jesus, a desire to see others come to know him and to grow in him. And then lastly, in that little acronym of real, uh, the word live. You know, the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ. That means every day that God gave him, he said, I'll live it for your glory and honor. For to me to live is Christ to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, so if I wake up this morning, my heat my feet hit the floor, if I'm living still in this earthly body, it will mean fruit. This will mean fruit from my labor. That's how Paul looked at it. That every day that God gave him would be another day of living for God, living for his glory and his honor. 
And then, of course, also in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now, what, church? Which I now live. Which I now live in the flesh, acknowledging, still in this, in the remains of this, this, this mortal, corruptible body, although in this earthen vessel I have an eternal treasure, his name is Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But this life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. And then Peter says in his epistle, in the first one, chapter 4, that as followers of Jesus, we should no longer live the rest of our time in the, in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That's what we're called to do. So we see the apostles directing us that we are to live for God. So real, uh, remembering, examining, asking, living. All right. But today we're looking at this matter of considering Jesus' word do this. And so before we l go back to that Passover setting and consider Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me, my mind went to just how many times we see Jesus directing his followers to do. I remember years ago, I was at a function at another church, and somebody that I've known for years, how you doing? I'm good. How's your... And I don't write all, all what went into that quick little conversation, but I said, but I praise God, you know, for a spirit who helps me live you know, and, and do his will and this and that. And he said, oh, that's what grace is all about. All you got to do is believe. Said, well, I get that. I, I'm 100% with we are saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I get that. But a faith without works is also dead, James said. And so let me just, and, and not putting any heavy burdens on you, and, uh, but just listening to Jesus' words, being reminded, uh, take into consideration just some things that he did say, do this. Well, my mind goes to, when I think of Jesus' preaching, teaching, there's that great three-chapter section known as the what? Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, those of us who have the daily devotional where we read through the New Testament, uh, Matthew chapter 5. In, in, in my notes earlier this week, I thought, we're going to go there, we're going to look at this, and then looking at the devotional for all this week, you'll be reading through the Sermon on the Mount if you follow that. And if you don't have the devotion, you wonder what in the world I'm talking about, then suggested reading today, or for this week, would be Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because there, and throughout all of Jesus' earthly ministry, we find him directing his disciples to do things. His followers um, were then and are now, really, we, we display genuine faith when we practice, when we obey his words, right? His teaching, his commands. And we don't do things in order to be accepted or made right with God. It's not our doing that makes us right with God. But because we have been made new, there's a desire to live for God, to, to honor his commands, to obey his commands. So just consider a few of Jesus' words uh, do this from his teachings uh, that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. It's here that we learn about the kingdom of God in the Sermon on the Mount. We, it's here that we see Christian character described in what true blessedness and fortunateness, that's, that's not a word, what truly, what being blessed is and, and what really it looks like to be fortunate, uh, what kingdom happiness truly is, uh, and that's found in the Beatitudes. In the Sermon on the Mount, we also see how the subjects of God, of, the, of, of King Jesus, how we're to conduct ourselves, right? So consider a few of his teachings. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men. He's calling us to do this. Let your light so shine before men. Why? Because God's glory's on the line. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
in heaven. He says a little further on, but I say to you, love your enemies. So anytime we're, these are directives, these are our commands, let your light shine, love your enemies. Why? Because this brings glory to God. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. These are things that Jesus commands us to do. Are we saved by doing them? No. We're not saved by, by observing the Lord's table, by, by uh, acknowledging uh, baptism. We're not saved by those things. But because we are saved, we do them. We're to be like our Father in heaven. He, he makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And that's how we are to be. We don't have time to go through the whole Sermon on the Mount, but when you move yourself or when you move along to chapter six, we learn that we are to be charitable. We are to pray. We are to pray asking for God and His name and His person to be honored and glorified. Uh, we're asking his kingdom to come and his will to be done. We see there Jesus says, when you pray, pray in this manner. And so we're also to ask for our daily needs. And that does include being kept from temptation and asking him to deliver us from what, church? From evil. What else do we see in this matter of considering Jesus' words do this? Well... Further on, chapter 6, we see and we need to consider what a proper focus is, uh, focusing on what and where we are to invest our lives, our means, what we are to treasure. In Matthew chapter 6, we read in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because they're just temporal. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. These are, these are things Jesus tells us what we're to do and not to do. And again, doing them, not doing them, isn't what saves us. But it's evidence of, of, of genuine faith. And how you and I live does matter. It, li it matters for us and it matters for those around us and it matters for the glory of God. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Consider Jesus' words here where he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food and body more than clothing. And the answer, of course, is, is what? Yes, our lives are much more important than that. Don't be anxious, don't worry, don't fret. Trust in the providential care of God. Then he directs us in, in, in a very common verse, Matthew 6, 33, where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus says to do. Uh, Jesus, what do you want me to do as a follower of yours? I want you to seek me first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. When you look at that contextually, uh, the, the food, the clothing, the drink, everything else in life is going to just all fall together as it should. It may not always fall together as you want it, as I want it to, but God will definitely bring it together as he wills. And we trust that. How about in chapter 7? Judge not that you be not judged. We are to be wise, we are to be, be discerning, but we are not to walk around with this superior attitude and that others are subordinates to us and, and I'm better than you and I understand why you did this and you shouldn't have done it. Judge not and you be not judged. You want to measure somebody up? That same measurement that you're using is going to be measured back on you. Don't do that. In fact, he said, uh, hypocrite in verse 5, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Further down, we see the golden rule, what is known as the golden rule. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Considering Jesus' words, we've gone into this second Sunday of the new year. I just want to remind us what 
God's Word says, and to consider, and, and really consider. I, I looked that up. You'd think, well, it's just, it's consider, Scott. What's so hard about that? You make everything difficult. Well, consider. Let me, let me add to it so that we will spend some more time considering things. Consider to see, to behold, to discern to experience, to advise self with. I can just see David in my mind and soulmate, you know, just how contemplative he had to be and how he did take things into consideration and just was wowed by them and awed by them and struck by them and taken back by them. And I pray that we are that way with God and with His Word, that we would take things into consideration. And as we take them into consideration, the teachings of Christ, that we would obey them, that we would do them. First slide, and there's only, a, I think, four today. Uh, let's consider Jesus' words Let's consider the weightiness of considering his word, uh, hearing his word, doing his word, right? And so it says, not everyone who says to me, and this is again from the Sermon on the Mount wrapping this up, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Just stop there on that one. May the Spirit of God get a hold of the heart and the mind and the will of an individual who doesn't know Christ and reveal this clearly to them that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. You can have this superficial faith and think that everything's fine, and, and this is a warning of Jesus. If the Lord gives us next Sunday morning, we'll be returning to Luke chapter 12, and we see a beware in the very first verse. Well, in a sense, to me, this should caution us. This should cause us to sit up straight and think about this, consider this, that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about examining ourselves. Paul in 2 Corinthians, I believe, 13, I think it's around 5, where he says to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Prove it, test it. Is that true? Who's going to be in glory? Those who believed in the existence of God? No. He who does the will of the Father in heaven. You're making salvation a matter of doing. No. Genuine salvation is not just a belief. It's a committed trust that is seen by faith and obedience. When we look at the next verse. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and what, church? Does that. Oh, yell it out so that people on the other end of this thing think there's hundreds of you here. No, no. Yeah, does them. One friend told me years ago, they're, they're Jesus' commands, not suggestions. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and the Holy Spirit of God, let people hear the sayings of Christ. Give them a desire to, to open the Word of God and to read it. Give them a desire to, to hear the Word of God on a radio, on a TV, whatever. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Therefore, whoever hears these saying to mine does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Wow. Who's wise in God's eyes? Those who hear His Word and puts them into practice. Who's foolish? Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, that's just a little bit of, uh, of this matter of considering Jesus' words and doing them. So now we come back to our beginning text. The setting is the Passover we, we looked at verse 14, and 
this is the final Passover that he would share with his apostles. Uh, he, he's hours away from the cross. And, and so as that, as that meal, as that Passover meal is, is taking place, really what we're seeing here is a, is a fulfillment, if you will, of, of Old Testament and, and the ushering in, if you will, uh, of the new and living way, the new covenant that we read about in, in Hebrews chapter 10. And so in looking, if you will again, look at your Bible, uh, when, when the hour had come, that hour, when, when it was turning, uh, the day was beginning to turn to dusk, if you will, and, and, and the hour from 3 p.m., 6 p.m., the, 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 the lambs would start being sacrificed for the Passover meal. Uh, again, suggested reading this week would be Exodus chapter 12. I can't spend any time there today, but encourage you to. Because this is what Jesus is doing here with his apostles. He's doing what most of the Jews did then, and that was the celebration of the Passover when, when God passed over the homes that didn't just believe what he said, but applied what he said. Sacrificed the lamb put the blood on the lintel on the doorpost and the and death did not come to the firstborn of that home where that was applied and so down through the ages the Jews the the, the children of Israel would remember that well here sitting with the apostles is the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world, as John said. The lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. We get very familiar with communion. Do you think the apostles were very familiar with the Passover? Sure. Could it have become old hat or routine, routine, yeah, routine to them? I'm almost up to last Sunday's stumbles and fumbles. Yeah, it could have become routine to many. But this was one like no other one. In fact, as this Passover celebration is coming to a close, he now ushers in the new covenant. So when the hour had come, when the, the hour, it all funnels down to this. In the fullness of time, Christ came. We celebrated that last month. Well, here is an hour, here is a time, a uh, time when the, when the sacrificial lambs would be uh, slaughtered and offered. And here, Jesus, the Lamb of God, coming to this hour, this hour of suffering, this hour of offering himself. Look at verse 15, then he said to them, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, before I give myself for the sins of the world. Well, let me direct your attention to verse 19 if we can. And he says, I, I will not no longer even until fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And many scholars believe that means when he comes to set up his rule and his reign. Verse 17, he took the cup, gave thanks, said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19 is what I want us to direct our attention to. And by the way, we are having, we are uh, celebrating, we are commemorating, uh, we are beating, being obedient to the sacrament, the ordinance of, of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper today. So uh, if you have not uh, picked up a communion set, please consider doing so. But when we look at verse 19 of Luke 22, it says, and he took bread and so we're considering Jesus' words, considering his words, do this, do this. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I said probably two or three years ago 
time goes by so fast, you, you think that something was two or three years ago, and it might be five or six. How many of you experienced that? But, but th- it's been a few years ago, but the, 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 the phrase, those words, my body given for you, just stood out. And I, so I really tried to present that a Sunday morning. And I want you to consider those words. But first, though, let us consider that he, he took bread. It's bread, common bread, all right? He, he took bread. He's using it as a symbol, as a sign, if you will, a, a tangible, uh, literal, physical element, but metaphorically speaking of the great sacrament, the, the, the great observant, the sacred thing of the Lord's Supper. That bread, which he gave thanks to the Father to, and then gives to his apostles there, is saying, this is my body. It's not literally my body, but it symbolizes my body. Jesus said he was the living bread. Jesus said he was the bread of life. Jesus said he was the living waters. And we, we do, we come and we feed upon him in, in new birth, spiritually speaking. And so he's using this bread as a metaphor. Uh, this represents me. And, and me giving my body is symbolic of me giving my life. And so when you do this, You do this in remembrance of me. Now, how often do we do this? Uh, We do this typically once a month. I think the more often we do it, there's going to be more of a tendency, the more frequent, uh, the more possible that could become, again, routine. May it never be routine to us. May we stop and consider what Jesus is saying. (laughs) This is my body. Personally, this is my body. The bread's not his body. It represents. It's symbolic of. And guess what? It's given for you. Jesus personally given for you and I personally. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But let's bring it down home. The Lamb of God who has taken away my sin. He gave His body for me. That should humble us. That should move us to gratitude, to tears of joy and thanksgiving. And He tells us to do this. And that is to do it in remembrance of Him. In remembrance of Him. Alistair Begg borrowed... Uh, a few notes from a, a pastor friend of his, last name Alexander, I didn't catch it. But he says at the Lord's Supper, this Alexander says this, that at the Lord's stop, Supper we see five things. We see instruction in which we, uh, instruction in which we obey Christ, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. We see commemoration in which we remember Christ, Right? We see proclamation in which we preach Christ. Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim Christ. It's a participation where we feed on Christ. And this is where some believe in transubstantiation, where it literally turns back, or it turns back into the body and the blood of Christ. I don't believe that for a moment. Jesus is there. His body is there before them. This is my body, which is given for you. It's symbolic. The sign speaking of a greater reality. Spiritually speaking, he's the bread of life, he's the living bread, he's the living water. This all begins at new birth and the obedient act of sharing. In the obedient act of sharing in this sacrament, he meets with those who come in faith. And I added this, throughout God's word we see that he blesses obedience. Right? 
His favor is upon those who trust him, those who obey him. And also, fifthly, in, in this, uh, what we see in the Lord's Supper is anticipation in which we wait for Christ. Again, for as often as we eat this bread, drink this cup, we proclaim his death, what? Until he comes. We're, we're looking with anticipation of his return. So we need to consider Jesus' words. And his words here in this verse we see is that this is his body which is given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. Don't ever do it out of, out of thoughtless ritual. Do it with thanksgiving in remembrance of him. You know, in Exodus 12, those lambs that were slain, and down through the ages, throughout the Old Testament, thousands, perhaps millions of lambs sacrificed, sacrificed, but all pointing ahead to the day where God's lamb, Jesus, would once and for all be the sacrifice. And so you and I now, we look back. We look back. They looked ahead. We look back at what he has done. And what was accomplished, which again, was our salvation, our ransom. You know, in Paul's words, if you can, next slide, please. And most scholars believe that Paul's words... 1 Corinthians 1 was written before Luke's gospel and the other gospels. And what we find, and you can turn there real quick if you'd like, uh, but we find Paul giving instruction to the church of Corinth. In fact, in verse 17, or verse uh, 23, Paul says this, For I receive from the Lord. This wasn't from other apostles. This wasn't someone else instructing him. Paul says, I have received from the Lord, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Church of Corinth, this is how the Lord's Supper is to be observed. This is how the sacrament, the ordinance, whatever you want to call it, this is how it is to be done. It's to be done, though. Considering Jesus' words, do this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed brought that in, the Spirit of God bringing the fact, to just add to that night the betrayal. And that betrayal actually fulfilling prophecy. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what Jesus instructed Paul. This is how Jesus instructed Paul to observe the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. What is often called communion. In the same manner... And now we have these two verses on the, on the screen, on the wall. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This new covenant is sealed. Christ is the one who has sealed it. His life, his sacrificial death sealed this covenant. His resurrection makes it the new and the living way as it talks about in Hebrews. Chapter 10. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In what church? Yeah. That's why I wanted you, us, that's why I want us to remember. Remember who God is. Remember what his word says. Remember who we are in Christ. We see in this passage in verse 28 where Paul says, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
When we come to this table, the Lord's table, this sacrament, if you will, the sacred, the sacred ordinance, may we not do it flippantly. May we consider and may we ask God, God, search me. I don't want to eat, eat in an unworthy manner. Search me, examine me. And then it says, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And I've told you this many a times. Paul's desire was for the church to celebrate, commemorate, be obedient to the Lord's Supper. Jesus' command to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So this warning, this, this, this caution of examining wasn't to uh, hopefully bring about exclusion, but restoration and participation with, with the others. And so... This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it. We don't know how often that is. He says, but as you do it, you do it. You do it in remembrance of me. And then he says this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so... Uh, and again, I like what Bag says when he says, when we come to the Lord's table, we recognize that there is a reminder here that for our past, God has given us a cleansing and a forgiveness. For our past, God has given us a cleansing and a forgiveness. For our present, right here, the here and now, for our present, he provides us fellowship and strength. And for our future, he has promised us assurance and, enjoy, and joy. So when we remember him, when we do this in remembrance of him, these are the blessings that are ours during this time of obedience in the Lord's table. So we are to look back with thankfulness, and we are to look ahead with anticipation, and we are to be obedient and do this in remembrance of him. So, if you have your cup, we are going to take a few moments to ask the Lord to search our hearts. <coughs> yes, Christ has died for all of our sins, our sins of our past, present, future. He died once for all for our sins. When we come to Christ by faith, our sins are cleansed. We are cleansed of our sins. But as we go through life, we sin. And though our sins were dealt with once and for all, we come to Him. Not to be forgiven again, cleansed again, but for that parental, I guess, if you would, that, that relational cleansing. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you that we can come to the table through Jesus and through Jesus alone. We thank you for the forgiveness that is ours. We thank you for the new life in Christ. We thank you that we've been rescued, delivered. We've been ransomed. We are grateful for that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the teachings and the commands of Christ. And Father, we help us to live obediently, knowing that we're saved by grace, not by what we do, but also knowing that your spirit within puts within us a desire to live in obedience, to do as you have called us to do. And so in remembrance of Christ, in the remembrance of him giving his very life, in the remembrance of him, his blood being shed, his blood 
for without the shedding of blood, of course, there's no remission of sin, no forgiveness of sin. And so knowing that we have been forgiven, uh, we eat of this bread, we drink of this cup. So let us take of the bread, knowing that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the living bread. The words that I speak to you are spirit, Jesus says in John 6. This bread symbolizing a sign of the person of Christ. In remembrance of him, let us eat. Father, we know that your word says that uh, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And how Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. We thank you for his Jesus' obedience to give his very life, to give his very lifeblood that we may be forgiven. In remembrance of him, we drink of this cup. I want to close with uh, the Great Commission, if you will, and you might think, well, that's a little odd, isn't it? No. The, the two sacraments that we acknowledge, ordinances that Jesus gave to the church is the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, and baptism. And at Faith Bible today, we were having two men baptized, and uh, where do we get that from? Well, let, let's close with these two verses. In verse 18, by the way, which, not, which is not posted, all authority has been given to me. Jesus spoke, said to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and, and on earth. Go, therefore, as you go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. There it is again. We need to consider Jesus' words, considering Consider what he said to do, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. That's a present comfort, isn't it? And yet again, a look into the future, anticipation, even to the end of the age. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We pray we are grateful for uh, the ordinance, the sacrament, the sacredness of the Lord's table and of Baptism, uh, outward signs of that inward work of your grace, uh, help us to live for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.
Father, we just thank you for the truth. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that you are immutable. You never change. The Jesus that we read of in your word, Jesus who broke bread, gave it to his disciples, the one who said to do this in remembrance of me, the one that we see there is the same one, the same Jesus who sits at your right hand, who lives to make intercession for us. Father, may we ever live for him, as Paul says, for, for to me to live is Christ. Help us to live devoted, committed, surrendered lives to you, Father, through faith in your son, Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.